Hello all, welcome to our webinar. My name is Corey Hastings and I am North Pier Search Consulting's Director of Communication. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and welcome you. Today's webinar, uh, as a reminder, our speakers who I will be introducing soon, will be available to answer questions at the end of the webinar. So please use the Q&A function that you will see at the bottom of your screen, or maybe it's at the top of your screen, to type out your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will ensure that it's answered. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Joining me from our team at North Pier Search Consulting is founder and managing partner, Jim Scheinberg, as well as senior consultant, Freeman Wood. North Pier's team of search and evaluation experts provide oversight, evaluation, and search or RFP services of investment consultants, OCIOs, and other service providers. We have administered over 90 evaluation and search projects, totaling over 120 billion in assets. Jim also serves as an expert witness for landmark ERISA litigation and as an independent expert for the United States Department of Labor. Also speaking today is David Hall, the Chief Marketing Officer from Hall Benefits Law. And uh, David, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself and Hall Benefits Law before we join uh, dive in. Thanks, Corey. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be with our friends from North Pier Search Consulting and a real honor to present to the audience today. I appreciate uh, being included. Uh, HBL uh, serves clients in 40 states. We have the capabilities to do so in all 50. We are a boutique ERISA and employment law firm uh, with specializing in employee benefits, legal compliance. Uh, we have a proactive approach, uh, which I hope you'll hear through our presentation today. And, and our goal is to help you as plan sponsors to stay abreast of the latest developments in employee benefits legal compliance. And if you haven't already, I would ask that you would please follow our LinkedIn company page or sign up for our newsletter on www.hallbenefitslaw.com so that we can stay in touch with you and keep you abreast again of, of any important developments in the, in the world of employee benefits legal compliance. So uh, with that, again, I am excited to be with you today. I'm gonna pass this on to my friend Freeman and we'll jump into the content. Terrific. Thank you very much, David, and thanks, Corey, for that introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you could join us today. Um, we're going to cover a lot of information, and hopefully you'll find it valuable, and we'll have some good dialogue through the, through the discussion. We wanted to start uh, with a question. Um, as asset owners, uh, you have the ability to use a wide variety of service providers, everything from something as simple as uh, outsourcing um, advice or looking for advice, legal advice, um, looking for uh, investment advice to outsourcing uh, all of your functions relative to investment management. Um, along that spectrum, um, it's important to understand what you're actually outsourcing in terms of the functions and how much of your responsibility, and in particular your fiduciary responsibility, uh, you need to retain. And with that, uh, when you hire a third-party service provider, what are your responsibilities to monitor and oversee the activities of those service providers? And where does that sort of fiduciary responsibility lie? Next slide, please. In the discussion today, we're going to really focus on the risks and the responsibilities of outsourcing investment-related activities relative to your third parties and third-party providers. And why, um, despite the fact that you can outsource a lot of functions, uh, a lot of activities, you really cannot uh, outsource your fiduciary responsibility. So if, you, if that's the case, um, what are you required to monitor and oversee your, of your service providers? And, and what does that actually do? And what are the benefits of, of this monitoring program? How can it help your organization to optimize your outcomes and minimize your risk? And that's gonna be the focus of the discussion today. Um, a lot of the discussion will use language relative to ERISA retirement plans, but much of the information and, and the recommendations and, and um, information we provide in this presentation is applicable to investment management in general. Next slide. So I want to turn it over to David to discuss uh, fiduciary responsibility. Thanks, Freeman. And uh, while I'm not an attorney, I do work with a great team of attorneys uh, with well over 100 years of experience between them. And it is our job as a team here at HBL 
to remind plan sponsors of the foundational basics of what it means to be a fiduciary so that uh, hopefully you're not hiring us to fix a complex problem uh, that that is fully preventable. And so as such, I want to remind you as a fiduciary that most cases of fiduciary breach or failure of fiduciaries uh, to fulfill their duties are unintentional. And this basic understanding of what it means to be a fiduciary, the different types of fiduciaries can go really a long way to preventing those future problems. So I would encourage you, even if you've heard some of this before, to, to try to pick up something new through our presentation today. And again, I'm here to reinforce the points that North Pier is making relative to doing a search and having objective uh, search criteria uh, from the perspective of an ERISA legal partner. So let's just look at the three types of ERISA fiduciaries. Your 316 is typically your named plan administrator or your TPA. Uh, so as you can see on the screen, this person or this, uh, this function as a, as a fiduciary is responsible for the administrative functions of an employee benefit plan. So if you are uh, using a TPA, your TPA would typically fall into this 316 category. The DOL uses the 321 nomen uh, nomenclature or, or numbering of the fiduciary as sort of a catch-all. So if you have any discretion or authority over employee benefits plans, then you are considered by the Department of Labor and by the code under ERISA to be a fiduciary. So the 321 is your catch-all definition. And then the third type of fiduciary is a 338. And a 338 is typically someone who has management over investments, direct management over investments. So if you're working with an advisor, but that advisor does not provide direct management of your investments, they may not be a 338. But a 338 is someone who has the authority to manage, acquire, or dispose of assets. Okay, so you want to make sure that if you're working with someone who says they're a 338, that you have that in writing. So that should there ever be any question, uh, you can go back and we'll talk about memorialization a lot during my portion of the uh, presentation today. And this is the first in instance of that. If a provider is telling you something, make sure you get that, uh, that information in writing so that, again, if there's ever a question, you can back up, uh, back up your claims with, with any agency or participant who may have a complaint. Uh, next slide, please. Also, as a fiduciary, I want to reinforce the fact that you do have personal liability under the code. According to ERISA, a plan fiduciary shall be personally liable for losses to the plan, and they shall be subject to equitable or remedial relief the court may deem appropriate. We are actually working with a large plan sponsor client who is being investigated by the DOL. And right now we are jointly engaged not only to represent the plan sponsor, but individual members of the 401k committee, some of whom are not even employed by a large plan sponsor any longer. And so one of the things that's very important for you to do as a fiduciary for yourself and for other fiduciaries of the plan is to ensure that you don't confuse the ERISA fidelity bond with ERISA fiduciary liability coverage. That fiduciary liability insurance covers you as a fiduciary and the, the, the fidelity bond covers the plan participants to make sure that the plan is made whole should there ever be a, a breach or a loss. So uh, if you haven't already, please do as a fiduciary review those levels of coverage. And for larger plans, I would urge you to consider hiring a risk counsel to help you determine what might be proper levels of coverage there. So there's hey, a couple of foundational pieces. David, just a quick add on. Uh, it, it, it is a really great idea to bring in external counsel when you are a larger entity, um, because the minutia of the way you appoint fiduciaries can actually trigger several layers of different personal fiduciary liability. And th there's no greater example than a very high profile case back about 20 years ago, what a lot of people know about the bankruptcy of Enron. What a lot of people don't know is that as a result of the Enron bankruptcy in 2001, uh, the fiduciaries who appointed the retirement plan, the plan fiduciaries were actually found personally liable uh, two years well after the bankruptcy. So these things can actually linger on well past the point in time in which they occur. Uh, and so these people were no longer obviously part of Enron at that point in time because Enron had been gone for two years, uh, but yet the court still found those appointing fiduciaries liable 
uh, to the tune of about a half a million dollars. So uh, if you're in one of those structures where you're appointing people to uh, serve on an investment committee, serve on a plan committee that doesn't fully absolve it, you want to talk to legal counsel, talk to a firm like David's uh, to go into the, the documentation and the processes and the procedures to make sure that you've got a nice tight uh, oversight loop going on and fiduciary liability coverage. That, that's a great example, Jim, and also a great callback to what Freeman mentioned earlier, which is that uh, these fiduciary principles do extend beyond the retirement plan uh, into uh, larger big picture uh, financial aspects of running a business. And so let's not be, um, you know, let's not whistle past the graveyard. The, the fiduciary duties that we'll be talking about uh, on the next slide, uh, we can go ahead and advance. These do um, extend, and, and especially this first one, right? So there are five fiduciary duties that we talk about as ERISA legal counsel, and, and the, they are exclusive benefit duty, the prudent expert duty, diversification, plan adherence, and disclosure. And this first one, the exclusive benefit duty, really is uh, the same as what is often called the duty of loyalty. And what that says is that you're acting as a fiduciary solely in the interest of plan participants and beneficiaries. If you're doing anything as a fiduciary that is to benefit yourself or to benefit the, the corporate entity rather than to directly benefit plan participants and their beneficiaries, then you are, um, you are in breach of your duty of exclusive benefit. Uh, prudent expert duty states that a fiduciary must act with the diligence of a prudent person acting in a similar situation who is familiar with such matters. So in this case, what the DOL, the IRS typically look at is process more so than result. And I'm gonna mention the M word again, memorialization. You need to be memorializing not only the decisions you make, but why you're making these decisions and why as, as you make this decision, it is meeting this duty of prudent expert. So if you're making decisions in a vacuum uh, as a committee or as an individual fiduciary, and you're not thinking about what a prudent person with, and here's the language, acting in a similar situation, who is familiar with such matters. If you're acting in a vacuum and you're not familiar with the matters and you memorialize that decision, you're basically digging your own grave as far as the DOL is concerned uh, because you need to be memorializing the things you do right and why you made the decision. So again, so many times we, we scrutinize uh, process more so than we do result because we should be doing things the right way. Okay, the next, these are a little bit more basic, diversification. We need to make sure that plan assets are diversified to minimize the risk of loss. If the DOL or if a plan participant can show that you are not actively trying to meet your diversification duty, you've opened the door. Plan adherence. The genesis of so many plan failures that we see come through the doors here at HBL is failure to follow the terms of the plan document. It doesn't matter if you have a great committee charter in place, if the committee charter is telling you to do things that are antithetical to the plan document. So you need to make sure that all the pieces are working together from the charter to the plan document with the plan document really is that seminal piece of documentation that everything else should be branching off of. And then finally, disclosure duty. There are myriad disclosures that need to be provided to plan participants on an annual basis. Um, some more often, some less often than, than annual, and you need to be familiar with those disclosures. And as a fiduciary of the plan, you need to be ready to respond truthfully to any participant inquiry. So if, if, as, if as a fiduciary, you have a participant come and ask you a question, you should not give an off-the-cuff answer, right? You need to make sure, again, that you're not operating in that vacuum and that you're fulfilling your prudent expert duty by perhaps saying, let me get back to you on that and make sure that you're giving truthful uh, not that you would ever give a non-truthful response intentionally, but that you're meeting the disclosure duty under the plan. I apologize, my phone just rang. Let me put that on mute. Sorry about that. You know, one thought on on the disclosure item, David, Please. is is the um, it's multi-party disclosure. So we we get a lot of disclosures in the industry. Our record keepers send us disclosures. Our advisors should send us disclosures. Um, we're sending disclosures out to our participants as plan sponsors. Um, one really important thing to note is that it's not just always the responsibility to disclose, but it's also the responsibility to interpret disclosures as well. And a well-known document that should be 
regularly received by plan sponsors by the fiduciaries of those plan the, the, the retirement plans we're speaking about is that 408b2 disclosure and a lot of people think that the responsibility is on the service provider and the 408b2 just to remind everybody it's about 10 years old and that's the document that gets sent out that says this is how much you're charging we're charging you or how much we're making off of this service as a record keeper as an advisor etc and this is the, the suite of services we're offering, but it's actually under 408B2, the responsibility of the plan fiduciary to accept, understand, and acknowledge what's disclosed in that document and be comfortable with that. So it's the, the disclosure um, issue isn't just a matter of sending something out, licking the, licking the envelope and you're done. Um, if you do not as a plan fiduciary, feel comfortable with the adequacy of a disclosure, it's on you to dig in and get more and more information. It's not just as simple as relying on the responsibility of somebody to send that disclosure out to you. And I just want to chime in really quickly here. I see we have a few hands raised. Just a reminder to please use that Q&A function for any comments or questions, and we'll be sure to get those answered. All right, David. Thank you, Corey. And, and Jim, thank you. I, I especially appreciate your perspective. Um, I think that Corey may have mentioned this uh, earlier, but, but Jim has been involved in quite a bit of work as an expert witness in, in cases that involve uh, breaches of fiduciary duty or alleged uh, breaches of, of fiduciary duty. And so uh, be listening carefully when Jim chimes in because there's some good nuggets there. Um, let's look at the Retirement Plan Committee. So if you have a Retirement Plan Committee and you do not have a committee charter, uh, then your committee does not have the foundation that it needs to be successful and to be a good fiduciary of the plan. So that existence of the charter and then thoughtful uh, thoughtful membership, thoughtful um, approach to who's forming that membership of the committee is critical. The charter is the roadmap for the committee's structure and, comp uh, and, and composition. So it's gonna talk about membership. It's going to talk about timing. It's going to talk about governance. It's going to allocate fiduciary duties within the smaller group. It's going to talk about objectives and responsibilities. And a well-meaning committee charter, uh, just like a well-meaning fiduciary, can be completely misaligned with the plan document. So again, make sure you're using the plan document and that, that there's nothing in your, in your committee charter that is contrary to the plan document, because nothing can make a, a DOL investigation go south faster. Uh, than them recognizing that you've been operating as a committee, um, again, antithetical to the terms of the plan document. The committee should meet regularly. They're going to review and discuss investments. They're going to create documentation to support investment changes. We're going back to this idea of memorializing the why behind the decisions that you're making as a fiduciary and as a committee. Um, the committee should be very carefully selected. It should include representatives from across uh, the organization, so folks from human resources, finance, business, legal, and then as, as far as it goes, um, memorializing what you do as a committee, every retirement plan committee meeting should have minutes to serve as documentation of discussions, actions, and decisions. Those minutes can be reviewed by legal counsel. We review a lot of committee minutes here at HBL, and the larger your plan, the, um, the greater the import of ensuring that you are memorializing decisions you make properly in your committee minutes. Uh, minutes can be taken by a retirement plan advisor, but again, you wanna make sure you're working with an advisor uh, or uh, OCIO uh, or any number of different service providers who might be involved in these meetings that you have vetted properly through an objective uh, service provider review uh, using someone who has no conflict of interest. So why are these minutes so important? They capture a record of decisions, they reduce mistakes down the road, and these courts, litigants, and governmental regulatory authorities like the DOL, they examine meeting minutes with a fine-tooth comb to assess whether a breach of fiduciary responsibility has occurred. And Jim, you may have something to say here. I believe we we are preparing for this. Again, you had some, some uh, experience through expert witness that speaks to the importance of, of memorialization or, or perhaps not memorializing certain things. Thanks, David. I will tell you, so not having, David spot on, not having minutes um, is, the, is the worst offense. Um, but be careful what you put in those minutes because I will tell you, I actually have a case that I worked on where there was a 10 year record that was examined 
it was 350 pages of minutes, a very large multi-billion dollar uh, client of ours. And uh, nuances of phrases were analyzed and then picked apart by plaintiff's counsel. Uh, so just be careful and, con and contemplate of what you're putting in. Don't put in more than you need to, uh, but also make sure you put in enough uh, that, that it shows your process and your mindset. These are things that are really important to evidence. It's not just the decisions you make, but showing your mindset as a fiduciary, um, expressing those in your minutes is very, very helpful defense. I will also make a quick comment. It is perfectly fine to have your retirement plan advisor um, provide a draft of your meeting minutes. But because they're a party of interest to the relationship, and this whole webinar is about overseeing uh, service providers, including your advisor, they're your minutes. And at the end of the day, you should review those minutes, feel free to edit those minutes, and feel free to add on to those minutes. And I would go as far to say as in your process, whether it's annually or quarterly or less frequent, you want to make sure that your oversight of your advisor is also memorialized in those minutes. So maybe ask them to leave a meeting and have another 15 minutes to discuss that relationship. Make sure that makes it in the minutes. If you're leaving that key element out, the oversight of your retirement plan advisor, especially if it's under ERISA 338, where you've given them discretion to manage the menu, you've got a very large blind spot in your, uh, in your fiduciary procedural prudent record. Great. Thank you for uh, thank you for that, Jim. So uh, we're probably all asking when is David going to talk about fiduciary breach litigation? Well, here here we go. So uh, you know this has been going on for a long time, and I would be remiss uh, if I don't mention now, and I'll probably mention it again, that as a fiduciary of of the benefit plans at your business, uh, your fiduciary duty extends to health and welfare plans. So these concepts that we're talking about relative to retirement plans. Uh, are really coming into the spotlight uh, on the side of health and welfare. So if you're a larger employer and and you feel like oh, I've really got my my thumb on top of you know I've, I've got my mind wrapped around all these fiduciary issues on the retirement plan side, it might be time for you to start thinking about doing the same on the health and welfare side because we're beginning to see the plaintiffs bar become more and more active and seeing actual cases come uh, before the courts uh, you know basically alleging fiduciary breach on the side of health and welfare. But let's talk about retirement plans. Uh, I have a SHRM article up on my second monitor right now. GE will pay $61 million to settle a 401k mismanagement lawsuit. Okay, granted, this is a very large plan, but scale that down a bit. Imagine you have a smaller plan than GE. Uh, this is a very large payout, uh, regardless if you think about these participants um, who were impacted by this. And, and if, if it can happen to GE, uh, you know, th this should be a good cautionary tale for all of us. On your slide, uh, what we say here is that in recent years, the basic complaints, I'm going to change that word a little bit. I'm going to say the foundational complaints. These aren't basic complaints. These are these are foundational complaints that either plaintiffs are coming to, uh, to, to, to bring lawsuits against these folks or the agencies are finding areas where fiduciaries have fallen short. They are not negotiating and monitoring the direct and indirect compensation that service providers are receiving from the plan or from the organization. This is critical, it's foundational. They're relying on faulty processes. Perhaps the process that they're relying on is outlined in their committee charter, but that process does not jive with the plan document. Okay, that is a very foundational issue that needs to be fixed if you're operating under that manner. Failure to monitor investment fund performance and reassess the cost efficiency available. Guys, there are so many different options out there. Make sure you're working with a search provider who will help you identify service providers that are that are that that have a comprehensive suite of services available to you so that you can make sure you're checking every single box. And then finally, making sure that you understand any potential conflicts of interest that these service providers may have. Um, Let's uh, let's go back to Jim just for a second. We were talking about uh, advisors wearing their 338 hat or not wearing their 338, 338 hat at the time a decision was made. Jim, can you dig into that a little bit? Because I thought you explained it well yesterday, yesterday when we were speaking. I can. Thanks, David. And I've got to I'm going to be a little vague on this because I'm actively engaged on one of these cases. So um, I, I I'll speak very broadly. But there are some um, pretty, I think, at least well-established 
cases uh, that are moving through the courts right now. That doesn't, I'm not weighing in on the merits of them, um, but at least the claim is well established. It's moved through motion uh, to dismiss. Uh, and they're, they're, one's already gone actually to trial of where the issue of a retirement plan advisor who is a fiduciary on the plan, either under section 321 or 338, as David talked about, also recommended a service of their organization that increased their compensation if it was selected. And so the issue that's been raised in this case is whether or not it was clear that the advisor in that situation wasn't wearing the hat of a fiduciary in that moment. So in other words, they're in there, they're selling a service. And so was it clear to the plan sponsor as to whether or not that trusted fiduciary relationship was put on a shelf for a moment and now they were literally selling a product or a service and it was up to the plan sponsor to evaluate that independent of the fiduciary advice from the advisor. This happens not at every advisory shop on the street. There are a lot of advisors that say, no, never, we won't do it. We always are a fiduciary period, end of story. And then there are other situations where the fiduciary wears the fiduciary hat most of the time. Then they take it off and they try and sell a product or service that may very well benefit the plan. Now, it's really important to understand that it's actually the plan sponsor's responsibility to understand the difference. Now, if you're lied to, that's a different story. Now we're getting into fraudulent issues. But if you don't discern between the two or you overly rely on the advice of somebody you are normally relying on their advice as a fiduciary, um, you can get put into a position of where you might be in breach or have made an imprudent decision. So when an advisor is coming in there and talking to you about other services, especially services where they're going to make more money, it's your responsibility to dig in, make sure you're clear and that you understand if there's a conflict of interest and make sure that you're comfortable with it if one exists. Excellent. Yes. And, and, and as you described that situation, right, the, the, the water gets muddier and muddier. So make sure that you're, you're asking the right questions at the outset. Uh, before you enter into a relationship with a provider. Uh, just next slide, please. We'll just take a look at some a couple takeaways from fiduciary breach cases. Um, guys, it cannot be overstated the importance of robust fiduciary compliance paradigm. Uh, the, pr the procedures associated with a robust paradigm, uh, the importance of that committee chart, right? So make sure that you're properly memorializing your prudent process, that you understand the five basic fiduciary duties under ERISA, that you are ongoing monitoring these service providers and that that monitoring is occurring through a non-conflicted party like a North Pier Consulting, right? So uh, these are non-conflicted parties and ERISA law firm is a non-conflicted party by the rules of the bar, right? And ERISA, an ERISA attorney is non-conflicted. Consistent, timely investment management lineup uh, evaluation is critical. Memorialization, proper memorialization of said evaluation. And so all of that to say, I think we formed a foundation and these are some basics that hopefully most of you were aware of and have at least been exposed to. But if you have questions about this or if you'd like to talk to legal counsel, you know, we'd be happy to have that conversation with you to talk a little bit more about ways that you may or may not be uh, meeting those duties as a fiduciary. So now I'm actually really excited uh, to flip the script a bit and get into a little bit more of the why, and certainly that, that foundational why we've discussed, but the why and the how of monitoring service providers. And I'll just go ahead and turn it over to North Pier and go on mute until future notice. Great, thanks, David. Uh, I, David and Jim give you, I think, a really good perspective on the complexities of uh, hiring a service provider and managing that relationship. Uh, certainly, um, everything from your fiduciary responsibilities to the, the legal and regulatory environment really argue for a much um, greater oversight than uh, most people would expect in these types of relationships. Um, we want to get into now um, how you actually monitor a service provider. What are the benefits in doing so? How do you approach it? How do you set it up? What are the areas should you look at it in, in, in some more specifics? Uh, next slide, please. So first of all, why do you why do you do this? Why why do people want to monitor this? Obviously, you got a lot of perspective from David and Jim uh, about this, but really, it's it's you're trying to set up a process or hire a third party to watch your back, uh, to really provide you support and to help you gain knowledge about what's going on in the market, 
what's going on with your service provider, um, making sure that uh, what they're doing um, are consistent with what you want them to do, uh, that their interests are aligned with your interests, that um, any changes or, or deviations relative to that provider are understood and the impact are understood. Um, it's a very dynamic environment. Uh, OCIO market is changing very rapidly. There's mergers, there's acquisitions, there's a lot of change, and that will affect your your relationship. And um, and there's there's a, a lot of potential impact to to change it in a negative way or in a way that isn't really meeting your fiduciary responsibilities, which is really why uh, you you think about monitoring in the first place, which is to meet those fiduciary obligations that that Jim and David um, have been talking about. Next slide, please. You know, Freeman, just a quick comment, because we throw these acronyms around in the industry a lot. Um, Dave did a really great job of outlining ERISA 338, meaning a fully discretionary relationship with your advisor. They, they hold the, the keys. Uh, Freeman mentioned OCIO. That's a uh, uh, an acronym that uh, is short for Outsourced Chief Investment Officer. And that term is synonymous in the, in the ERISA space, in the pension 401k defined benefit plan space. Um, with ERISA 338, as David talked about, and that's actually the code in which it's it, it's authorized under. Um, but for endowments, foundations, a lot of you actually have both retirement plans and endowments or foundations. Um, the acronym OCIO is used uh, synonymously. So I just wanted to make sure everybody who is on uh, on the call understands uh, that, that it really applies to both. Thanks, Jim. That's a great clarification. So, so what are the benefits that you get from a monitoring program? Um, and really, there there's some very specific ones. Um, first of all, you you can understand better the performance of your of your provider, and the performance can range from everything from how they service you, how responsive they are to you, are they doing things consistent with your policies, your procedures, your governance model, all the way through to specific performance uh, attribution uh, and uh, analyzing how well the investments are doing. Um, is it uh, is it is it uh, being uh, managed in the way that you want, um, or are there inconsistencies from from what they told you they would do? Uh, a good example of that is, is you have a program, you've outsourced it to uh, an, an OCIO, um, and you've got very good performance. You're very happy with it. Um, but what if, uh, if that performance is still under uh, performing the market? Or what if that performance is coming because of some random um, actions rather than an intentional way to manage your business? Um, the, the good performance may still be um, an indicator of, of something that's not quite right or many, being managed in a way that, that you don't uh, want them to manage. Uh, conversely, you could have underperformance and be concerned about that. But if the underperformance is still way better than the market, your provider could be doing a great job. And so understanding and getting the tools, and the information about that performance really can uh, give you an indication of how well that provider is, is doing their job for you. And are they doing it consistent with the with your governance practices, your your policies and procedures, and and all of that is to say that 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 monitoring program will give uh, stakeholders uh, a lot of assurance. I mean, you've got a lot of stakeholders in this in this area. You've got uh, plan participants, you've got boards, you've got investment committees. Um, a lot of people have a stake in this game, and um, this process really gives them assurance that there's some oversight, not just in uh, a quarterly basis or whenever you're getting a performance report, but really the details of how they're doing their job. You know, Freeman, you you, you ran uh, the operational due diligence department at a very large multinational consultancy. And this last item here on the list is really paramount. It's running that continual due diligence, that ongoing monitoring at that level is really there to ensure that stakeholder um, interests are being protected. It's it's the one out of a blank number of times that you catch something, you go through these procedures to make sure there aren't any problems, but occasionally they do arise. And if you're not watching the hen house, um, the fox gets in, right? <laughs> and, and and or it or just something goes wrong that yeah is unintentional. So right. so whether whether it's it's something that's intentionally done, um, malfeasance, fraud, or something like that, which is obviously something you want to be very aware of. And this monitoring program can help you to identify early if that's occurring, or if something's just going off the rails. Um, so you know, you think about uh, a car. You're, you're you've got a nice car. It goes very fast, and that's great. Um, 
But if something's going wrong, um, the oil is leaking, um, the, the brakes are failing, things that you don't check as part of your monitoring program, that fast car can go real slow, real fast. <laughs> so, you know, it, you know really, um, the, the monitoring piece is ensuring that that performance uh, of your provider will continue, um, not just in, in, a, in a beneficial way, but also consistent with the way you want it. I'll just, let me just piggyback and say, and you can leave it on that same slide, Corey, as you think about this, this idea of compliance with policies and governance requirements, legislation is an opportunity for plan sponsors. So, uh, you know, not so much right now, oh, you've got secure 2.0, so I take that back. Very much true in, in retirement plans, but especially on the health and welfare side right now, and, and this is analogous to, to secure 2.0, there's, there's a lot of tailwind for plan sponsors who want to take a proactive approach right now. If plan sponsors want to keep things the way they are, then more than likely you're eventually going to run afoul of a participant or of an agency. But if you are proactive and you're working with service providers and ERISA counsel who want to bring you up to the sort of the bleeding uh, front edge of the curve relative to existing legislation, you've got lots of opportunities to not only bolster your, your fiduciary paradigm, but to benefit your participants. And so, you know, the No Surprises Act, when we talk about health and welfare plans, you are uh, now as a plan sponsor required to make sure that you're not paying too much for healthcare. Guess who's doing that? Almost no one and none of the service providers with very few exceptions. Be one of the proactive ones, uh, both on the retirement plan side and the health and welfare side that stays aware of existing legislation through, oh, I don't know, a, a monthly newsletter from an ERISA law firm, through a relationship with a great search uh, search provider, right? And, and don't be left behind the curve because it really will benefit your organization and it will give you a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Thank you, David. Okay, so we've heard a lot about um, the complexities of these relationships. Um, we've heard a lot about um, the risks uh, and uh, potential areas of, of, of challenges that you have in these relationships. So you've decided that we're going to monitor this. We're going to we're really going to get involved in monitoring our providers. How do you how do you actually do that? And um, it really starts in, in sort of two parts. Um, one is how complex, uh, how uh, deep and how broad of a monitoring program do you want? And how often do you want to do that monitoring? Um, when once you decide those two things, then it's how do you coordinate it or integrate it into the cadence of overall periodic evaluations like RFIs or periodic RFPs? Um, that's a, it's a really critical piece of getting started and understanding it. And, and maybe, um, uh, Jim, you can talk a little bit about um, the different types of cadences and, and what's appropriate. Yeah, thanks, Raymond. And so, you know, and, we, and this really goes back, we don't need to flip back to the, the slide um, the, the couple before, but, you know, at the bottom, we said, you know, ultimately, you know, why do you do this? Is, and the answer is because it's your fiduciary duty. Um, there are three major groups of fiduciary relationships. Um, so we've got the ERISA area that was covered really well by David at the beginning, of where you've got a pension fund, 401k plan, defined benefit plan, 403b, et cetera. Um, there's also uh, endowments and foundations, and those can either be public in nature or private foundations. Um, we just got a great question that we'll cover towards the end here um, from somebody who I assume is a fiduciary at a private foundation from their question. Um, and those regulations are um, slightly watered down versions of ERISA, uh, which is you know the over overseeing pension law in the country. Um, and that's up MIFA, and each state has adopted either up MIFA as its own or uh, a certain version of it. But basically, it's a guidance for um, volunteer fiduciaries predominantly uh, to oversee those nonprofit bodies of pool, uh, pools of capital. And then if you are a fiduciary on a trust, and we actually, the biggest, it's not the largest piece of the work that we do, it's actually the smallest, but the fastest growing is actually complex family structures. Uh, and ultimately, there's a lot of trusts that are created in those where you have multi-generational wealth, and there are fiduciary trustees that oversee those, and that's under UPIA. And so each one of these is going to have a different set of cadences and also ramifications. If things aren't monitored, they go wrong, et cetera. Um, but ultimately, the way we look at things is, is that you should, A, you should always be overseeing the relationship. Um, it's the trust but verify type of mentality. You're hiring these firms, you're hiring these 338 advisors, these OCIOs to run that pool of capital for you or help you assemble the menu in your 401k plan. 
Um, at the end of the day, you should and want to trust them. However, you should verify that that trust is well placed. I can tell you in 10 plus years of doing oversight and evaluations, we've never seen an advisor come to their client and say, wow, I've really been doing a horrible job. Um, and every now and then they have been. Most of the time they're doing an adequate job or better. And so you really want to have that that you know that 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 scrutiny um, on a regular basis. So what that scrutiny looks like, we'll talk about the tools a little bit. Um, whether it's just overseeing um, the components, the performance attributes, whether it's running a full blown RFP and looking at the whole entire market, the cadence is going to be dictated based on your satisfaction with the relationship, how long you've been in that relationship. If it's been 15 years since you went out to market and did a search. Uh, to hire that advisory firm, then, and you've never done any monitoring ever since, it's probably been a little too long. Um, if you're benchmarking regularly, if you're getting some outside counsel from a firm like David Halls, or you're or you're working with a firm like North Pier just to do an evaluation or a monitoring and not necessarily a full-blown RFP, then maybe you can put off that RFP further because it's well-informed. So ultimately, what we say is, is that if you're happy, Three to five years is pretty best practice-y, but it's certainly not required in the pension space. There are some, by the way, on the expert witness cases that I work, there are plenty of experts out there that have actually testified to courts that said, you've got to run an RFP every three years, otherwise you're in fiduciary breach. There's never been a court that I know of that's upheld that position, but at least you should know that it's being argued in litigation, right? There are experts out there claiming that. If you're talking about a foundation, if you're talking about a family trust, maybe that number starts to slide a little bit further out. If you're unhappy, if you're unsatisfied or even unconfident, and when I say unconfident, meaning like you, you know, you may like your advisory firm, you may go, you know, golf with them or go to, you know, go to see a play with them and really have a good tight relationship with them and feel you're being well serviced, but you may not necessarily know that you should be confident in that relationship. That that fits in the spectrum as well. Obviously, if you're unhappy, that accelerates the timeline quicker. And then some of those items that Freeman mentioned, and I'll highlight one of them, should also accelerate that timeline. If there's been a key merger and acquisition event, if there's been a key turnover in the personnel that's servicing your relationship, that's a good indicator that you want to dig in and provide some more and, and, and get into some more due diligence, whether that's a full-blown search or just an evaluation. Getting some independent third-party help there is a really good time to come to that equation because everything that created that confidence in the past may not apply going forward under the new structure, whether it's service, management, ownership, et cetera. Great, thanks, Jim. Well, what is servicing or uh, monitoring service provider entail? You know, what really should a good monitoring program include? And we've listed a few areas here and we'll go through them in a bit detail, but um, you know, first it really starts with your contract, um, setting up the appropriate contract to achieve um, the objectives you're trying to achieve within the governance structure that you, uh, that you uh, intend to have. And then uh, over time, making sure that that service provider is actually living up to that contract. They're doing what they, what they say they, they want to do, or you, they, they told you they do. It includes um, an in-depth review of, of investments and in particular, manager selection. Um, when you hire a third party to manage investments, uh, they tell you how they're going to evaluate and select managers. Um, are they doing it in that way or has that changed over time? And are they doing it in a way that's consistent with your investment policy statement and the governance structure that you've set up? Now, this is really critical. You, you A key part of your documents uh, is your investment policy statement. And you need to make sure that your service provider is managing it consistently consistent with that statement. Um, also related to it, asset allocation. Um, once you're looking at that investment policy statement, you're looking at how assets are allocated. Um, and that changes over time. There's some, some dynamic aspects or some variability in that. But you want to make sure that uh, that allocation is still consistent with the objectives you established. It's consistent with what's going on in the market and that there's a, a robust plan with regard to your, your service provider, your investment um, manager and consultant to, to do that. Um, there's also, it's also important that, uh, you're, you're getting the deliverables that, that, uh, that you're, was told you're going to get. So, yeah, you've got 
in the contract a number of things that are established to, to be delivered. Um, you uh, have a lot of uh, specific requirements relative to your investment policy statement, your reporting, your quarterly meetings, et cetera. Are you getting all those deliverables on a regular basis and a timely basis? And is the service that you're getting, is it consistent with what you expect? Um, are they interacting with your staff, with your team, with your, um, your various other providers in a very effective way? Are they responsive? Um, are you satisfied with the service you're getting? Those are, those are key things. Um, and Jim just mentioned um, organizational changes. Um, it's a very dynamic market. These organizations change rapidly. There's changes in ownership. There's changes in personnel. There's change in the structure and how they deliver that structure. All of those changes are okay, provided um, you're still getting the service um, and you're getting uh, your needs met as a, as, a, as a client. And that's, that's really critical. And, and as David said, and, and Jim has said, is that all of this great work uh, has to be memorialized. It has to be documented because you've got to demonstrate that you're uh, indeed uh, fulfilling your, your fiduciary responsibilities. Um, and this documentation is a, a critical component. Uh, Jim, I know you had a, maybe some points you wanted to make on this as well. Yeah, um, Freeman, thank you. Uh, so the, the, the comment about documentation is um, there's a little bit more underneath that bullet point that I'd like to dig into. So you know, when you're going through this, this review process, one of the reasons why we get hired um, is because you know, we have this, it's just when you go in for, for those of us who have to get a health, you know, health exam every, every year or so to make sure that we've, you know, we've checked the boxes um, you know, at a certain phase of life, uh, or whether it's the analogy Freeman gave about the car, there's a checklist that you're going through. There's areas of examination. You want to be thorough. You want to have a well-informed understanding, and you want to be able to go back and evidence this to your stakeholders, to the Department of Labor. You know, if you're talking about a family, complex family structure, sometimes there's, you know, there's there's inner squabblings between uh, cousins or nephews or nieces. Uh, and even in the uh, in the nonprofit space, um, you have shareholders, or sh I should say stakeholders, that want to see that you've been a good steward of that capital, especially if you have things like donor advised funds in your programs and things along those lines. And so being able to document this diligence is incredibly important, not just from a perspective of liability management, but also to be able to have a process in the first place, right? If you don't have a plan, if you don't have a process, you don't have anything to document. And so it really starts at the beginning ends with the documentation, but what you're documenting really starts with the plan in the beginning. You know, I just want to focus in on this. We talked a little bit about this, but, you know, ultimately, the, the, especially in the 401k and defined benefit plan space, you know, there's there's case law that supports that you have to be doing all these things, um, is going all the way up to the Supreme Court in the Edison case that recently was decided back about five, six years ago, and then reaffirmed um, by the comments for Justice Sotomayor in the Northwestern case, even the Supreme Court has weighed in that you have a continuing duty to monitor these relationships. It doesn't stop when you hire that organization. We got a great question that I'll spend a little bit of time on right here at the end about hiring these organizations in the first place. Great question. What do you need to do in order to you know, make sure that you're, you're, you're um, going through the right steps? Um, but you have to be really ultimately looking at these items on a regular cadence. What that cadence is, like I said, varies um, based on type of organization and your relationship and, and your comfort with them. You know, I'll, I'll also just mention one quick thing. Freeman, I, I think it was really appropriate to mention that you want to make sure that your advisor, your um, OCIO or your 338 is adhering to your investment policy. But I'd also tell you that in all the cases we do with all we've done over um, coming up, I think, on 100 now and over $100 billion worth of evaluations, um, one of the things we see pretty regularly is advisory firms that are, um, I'll just say, morphing the investment policy statement and those report deliverables. So Freeman has those both of those bullets here that he mentioned. They're, they're actually losing some of their decisions in changing the IPS or the reporting um, and so if your advisor comes to you and says, hey, we really like international stocks for the next handful of years, we think you should go from 40 to 50 percent of your equities to international. If they're changing the investment policy at the time they're doing that, or they're changing the custom index that they're reporting in those reports that Freeman was mentioning, then that decision gets lost along the process as well. So it's not just that the reporting is happening and it's not just that the investment policy is being adhered to. You also want to pay attention to what's happening to those policies and those reports over time. So you wanna have, again, that trust but verify mindset as you look through um, the, the, those type of documents. 
Great. Um, so we got about 10 minutes left. We want to leave a little time to answer the questions that you've provided and, and see if there's any others. But maybe real quick, uh, Jim and David, you could talk a little bit about this sort of the, the pros and cons of doing it yourself versus hiring somebody like a North Pier or a Hall. David, you want to start? Sure, sure. Look, um, a lot of us are DIY type of people, right? I, I, I love to figure out what's wrong with technology. Um, and, and trust me, technology uh, is not my best friend. It goes wrong often, but I enjoy trying to fix it. I don't recommend having that same mentality relative to your uh, retirement plan or your pension plan. Um, so the as, as Jim was talking earlier about the importance of uh, the investment policy statement, for example, and, and the processes and procedures that go around that, I know for a fact that we have successful entrepreneurs. We have uh, very effective fiduciaries. We have business owners on this call, right? And, and I don't think you reach that level of success without having good policies, systems, and procedures in place. And so unless you're very comfortable doing it yourself, and that means that you're comfortable saying that, that you understand what a prudent person would do with full knowledge of the scenario, right? Then we just simply don't recommend doing it yourself. Uh, there's too many things that can go wrong. There are too many people out there in the marketplace trying to take advantage of people who are trying to do the right things, but just don't know how to do the right thing. Um, so again, as ERISA legal counsel, I think our team of attorneys is encouraging people to be proactive. And what that means is that you can do it yourself to whatever extent you are comfortable that your understanding of the mechanisms in place, the, the legal aspects, the, uh, the fiduciary breach potential that's there, you are fully aware uh, of the types of outcomes that are possible through the, through the decisions you make. And so as far as pros and cons go, I would say just don't go it alone. Uh, this is an industry rife with folks who do, again, want to take advantage. That doesn't mean that most people out there aren't great people trying to do right by the plan sponsor, but there are people who will take advantage. And, and, and working with a firm like North Pier and working uh, to find the right provider and then working with a firm like HBL to make sure your own fiduciary paradigm is buttoned up and that you're memorializing things properly along the way. Uh, I can't stress enough how many people come to us because they didn't have the help. They tried to DIY. Uh, I mentioned the, the client uh, earlier, uh, a large company, guys. This is a, um, a multi-billion dollar company with a very large retirement plan. They're in the middle of a DOL action, DOL action, and they've had to switch law firms. They've had to go back to prior members of the, the, um, the retirement plan committee and pull them into this legal action. You, you just, it's not worth it to do it yourself. It would, would be my observation. It's just not worth the risk. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to it. Um, I, I think that there's room for all of it. Um, you should always be doing it for yourself. Meaning, um, we go back to that trust but verify mindset. You should have this 90% little angel on your shoulder over here that says, these are my people. I trust them. They're doing a great job for me. And then you should have this little tiny skeptic on your shoulder over here that says, yeah, but I should probably ask a question about that. And there's never a wrong question to ask. It's trust but verify. And you can pick your own ratios. Um, but at the end of the day, you should DIY all the time. But should you only DIY periodically on the cadence that Freeman got into, you should seek external counsel because not only should you not trust but verify, you should trust but verify on your own, but you should also trust but verify that what you know to ask questions about is the entire corpus of the things that you need to ask questions about, right? And so, you know, internally at North Pier, we've got Freeman's got 30 some odd, 40 years of experience. Don't wanna, I don't want to, I don't want to tip the age, Freeman. Um, I, I will, I will tell you that I've been in a, in the ERISA consulting business since the mid nineties. You know, we've all been doing this decades and decades each. Um, and so, and we have tools, capabilities, systems, analytical suites that we bring to the table in this process. Um, and so you can't replicate that internally. So periodically you need to go to an organization like us to get that external expertise and we're not attorneys. So for those legal aspects, you do need to go to the hall benefits of the world to make sure that they've got your back as well. And so, you know, we talk about when do you hire, do you hire Hall? Do you hire North Pier? The answer is you probably want to rotate 
and also from time to time we'll refer to them the reason why we're doing this together is because you know there's things that are outside even though i'm an expert witness not an attorney i might be able to see a red flag but i don't know how to put it out um ultimately working periodically with either an independent third party or with uh independent law firm that can bring that expertise is augmenting your internal diy that should be going on regularly um I, just a caveat that you know North is not the only firm in the industry that does this although there's very few that do we were we were the first or at the same time kind of like a um, Marconi in the radio there was another firm that started doing this work a little over a decade ago at the same year we did um but ultimately uh there are a few other firms that are completely um unbiased in their approach to providing these services and there are other ERISA law firms you probably you know already know one or two um ultimately getting that objective advice is really helpful there are service providers that are out there that will do quote unquote plan reviews for you but are not objective they're trying to compete for your business they're trying to unseat an incumbent and if that's the relationship you can listen to what they have to say that may be another source of information but you should definitely consider the source and consider that they have an objective in the equation so that's on you to you know to make sure that you vet for yourself Corey, I know we have a couple of questions here at the end um, that we wanted to get to. I'll turn it back over to you. Yes. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have one question here. What have you factored into your service provider agreement as it relates to cybersecurity evaluation, monitoring, et cetera? Sure. Maybe I'll start with that one. Um, that's a great question. And we actually uh, recently um, with Hall did a cybersecurity uh, webinar, which um, we'd be happy to provide you a link to, which was, which was very, I think, uh, well received as, as well. But uh, uh, it's, it's, I think it's really important to make sure that service providers are aware of the risk, which they are, but they're also taking steps to, to mitigate that risk. So what we look for is uh, a series of policies and procedures relative to uh, identification and mitigation of cybersecurity risk, as well as policies for, policies for how uh, uh, breaches or problems are communicated with their clients. Um, and so th those those three areas, one is identification, uh, two is, is mitigation, and three is communication. Those are critical components that uh, we want to see with a, within a service provider, whether it's it's uh, explicitly laid out in the agreement or as part of the discussion with uh, with the client that this is what they're going to provide. That's that's very important. It's it's something that uh, it's it's obviously not going away. It can have a very material impact on performance. Um, it could it can uh, generate a lot of litigation. So uh, we want to make sure that the service providers um, are on top of it, that they're very active uh, in identifying, they're very active in mitigation, um, that uh, that they communicate if there's any breaches, and that um, it's a dynamic process. It's not just they've set it up and forget it. They don't have a, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, security on their browser, but it's a lot more than that, that they're, they're doing everything from, you know, testing, uh, intrusion testing to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that that they that their their firewalls and their and their security is, is is robust, but also sometimes, and we recommend this is hiring somebody else to help sort of evaluate and set up those policies and procedures. So it's a great question because it's it's a there's a lot of focus on it these days and continually evolving. Right. Thank you, Freeman. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Corey, if this is the case on North Pier's website, but we do have the full prior webinar on cybersecurity, DOL guidance, uh, best practices. All that's available on the HBL website. So please feel free to click into that link and uh, check it out. It's very good. Yes, that's also available on North Pier's website. So that resource is there for you. Um, we have one more question that I'd like to get to, but uh, if you have to jump off and you have a question that wasn't answered, I'm going to leave my email in the chat. So feel free to send us an email with your questions or comments and we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, with that, the last question we have is, how do you judge if a fee that you're paying is appropriate? Um, you know, I'll, I'll handle that quickly. Um, so the answer is uh, through process. Uh, the lowest fee is not the fee you have to pay. Case law supports that. Your fee has to be reasonable. Um, if the plan is paying for the fee, if it's an ERISA uh, uh, plan, if it's 401k defined benefit, then you need to make sure that not only are the fees reasonable, but that they're they're for services that are necessary for the operation of the plan. And we can delve into the minutia of that at another time. Um, but ultimately, that's why we get hired routinely for even situations where organizations are very happy with their service providers. 
there is this continual duty to monitor, like I'd mentioned the Supreme Court's upheld. Um, a lot of that is fee and service based. And so whether you're using benchmarks periodically or whether you're hiring a firm like North Pier to do an RFI for you or you're doing a full-blown RFP because it's been a really long time since you've gone to the market, these are ways that you can continually um, uh, ensure that you are um, paying a reasonable amount. And it's not just, by the way, to your service providers. You need to be doing this for every level of aspect of cost within inside your retirement plan. That includes the cost of the investments, the cost of the implementation of the investments. Anything that a retirement plan pays for is a fee that needs to be analyzed. If you're a plan sponsor and you want to write a check elsewhere, you can spend as much money as you want, as long as it's not the plan that pays for it. When you get into endowments and foundations, that same level of scrutiny absolutely applies. You want to make sure you're not mismanaging the, the, the plan, you're not overpaying. Um, but that goes back into that issue about whether or not you're managing, uh, this, you're stewarding those, those fees appropriately. I will tell you, as you cut into the family environment, the family trust environment, now fees get back into the equation. Divided interests come in there a lot where it's, okay, well, I'm getting a deal because I'm the trustee and for I'm getting wealth management services through the same firm, but the fees, you know, the fees expensive to the trust. You want to be really careful with that. And there's a lot of litigation that revolves around those services, divided interests and fees that are paid for those costs. And that's where we do some of that work as well. Great. Thank you, Jim. Um, so with that, we will conclude our webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, again, our emails are here on the screen. Thank you so much to Jim Freeman and David for providing all of that information. And thank you for everybody here for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.